Welcome everyone to our third Capitol Hill Day session on the ground, family planning and reproductive health programs around the world. Um, today, you're going to hear from a couple of wonderful advocates who are working on the ground to provide and expand access to health services in their respective communities. And we're so honored today to have Dr. Jalicia Jolly and Melvin Oyu joining us. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Rebecca Harrington, and I'm the Senior Director of Advocacy and Outreach for Population Connection and Population Connection Action Fund. I've been, I use she, her pronouns, uh, and I've been with Population Connection for almost 16 years, uh, fighting for reproductive health and rights for all, because I think that reproductive rights are really the foundation that allow us all to shape our lives. Um, so that's, that's me and why I think days like today and events like Capitol Hill Days are, are so, so important. Um, before we get started, though, I'd like to get, e get to know each of you a little bit more. Um, so in the chat, I'm going to ask you to drop your name, your pronouns, your location, and if you wrote an autobiography, what would the title be? So name, pronouns, location, and title of your autobiography. I'll give you a few seconds to think about that. And then I'll ask you to drop it in the chat in three, two, one, and send. I love this. Always wondering. Yes, mean. Heaven, life in heaven. <laughs> Anxious animal lover. <laughs> I'm fine. It's fine. Always a good one. These are great, keep them coming. Relaxed, I like that. My story, perfect. Susan, I'm sure that's not true. Um, I think mine would be called Heaven, um, five more minutes, I'll be right there. All right, we'll let people keep dropping it in. And then I'm just going to go over a couple of um, quick housekeeping points before we dive into the conversation. Um, We'll be, first off, we'll be recording this meeting um, so, so that we can share, share this recording after across our various social channels and on our website. So if you're not comfortable um, being recorded, please go ahead and shut your video off. Um, the second thing is to please keep yourself muted so that there's no audio interference while we're, our speakers are talking and while we're in conversation with them. Um, throughout, you should feel free to drop questions in the chat for our speakers. Um, we'll be leaving a good chunk of time at the end for audience questions um, after the discussion. And then a note on security, we have taken steps to make sure that this is a safe space, um, but there's always a chance that we could have online trolls who try to interfere with the event. Um, so if that happens, uh, we will share this image. until the person is removed. All right. And then finally, before we get started, um, we'd love to take a group photo. Um, so if you're all comfortable, um, if you could take your um, yourselves, uh, put yourselves on camera, I'll kick it over to Grace, who will take a screenshot of all of us. Hello. So I'm going to give everyone a sec to turn on their camera if they so wish. Then I'll count us down. Hello, everybody. And of course, feel free to turn off your camera as soon as we're done, if that makes you more comfortable. All right, looks like this is everybody. So I'm going to count us down to three, two, one, peace. Awesome. Thank you so much. It's great, and thanks everyone. It's nice to have photos, even if not all in person. All right, I'm having some issues um, with my sh screen sharing, so I'm gonna let Yasmin go ahead and, and share the image I just tried to share with you all. I 
Thanks, Yasmin. All right. So let's go ahead and get started. I am so thrilled to be joined today by two of my favorite colleagues, Dr. Jalicia Jolly and Melvin Oyo. Uh, Jalicia is a postdoctoral fellow and incoming assistant professor in American Studies and Black Studies at Amherst College. She researches and teaches on Black women's health, grassroots activism, and reproductive justice, the transnational politics of gender, structural racism, sexuality, class, and health, the intersectionality and in HIV AIDS in the US and the Caribbean, and Black feminist health science, Black motherhood, and birth justice. She's a fantastic speaker, organizer, and advocate. Melvin Oyo is a health expert and reproductive rights activist. She holds a BS in nursing from Great Lakes University of Kisu, a master's degree in public health with a specialization in population and reproductive health from Kenyatta University, and an MPA from the Harvard Kennedy School of Government. She's also the founder and executive director of Hope for Kenya Slum Adolescence Initiative. Melvin previously worked with marginalized communities at Family Health Options Kenya, a member association of the International Planned Parenthood Federation. For the past few years, Melvin has consulted for Population Connection Action Fund and the Fight for Her campaign, expanding its networks with organizations in Kenya and greater East Africa. She recently became a member of Population Connections Board of Directors. Melvin is tenacious, knowledgeable, and an excellent collaborator. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Melvin. We'll hear some remarks from her. Then we'll hear from Jalicia. Um, then I'll ask both of them a series of questions. And we'll leave plenty of time at the end for questions from you all. Um, so with that, Melvin, take it away. Thank you. Hi, everyone. It's always a pleasure and an excitement to be um, to attend the um, Capitol Hill Days event. Um, I really appreciate Rebecca for that introduction. I think I don't, I don't want to go ahead and do a further uh, introduction of who I am. I think I'll ask um, Yasmin to go ahead and project my slides as a guide for my presentation or my sharing this um, afternoon. Thank you. If we just want to go to the third slide. Yeah, I take this opportunity to welcome everyone and to appreciate everyone for your time uh, to join us at the Capitol Hill Days event. Uh, I just want to say that it has always been um, just fantastic listening to advocates and reproductive health activists, uh, activists presenting and sharing their experiences. Um, so uh, if we go to the next slide, we, I just look at the numbers um, that globally, um, about 4.3 billion people have inadequate access to sexual and reproductive health services, and about 270 million have unmet need for contraception. So this means that definitely these are people who are getting, uh, who uh, would want to use a uh, family planning but they will not have access or they do not have access to the commodity either because they are out of stock or because they are living in uh, long distances to the health facilities or because there are no facilities uh, where they, they live. Like for instance, last month I interviewed with uh, Abdiya like in um, Samburu County in Kenya. And she says in Samburu, it's not a matter of pro-choice or anti-choice. The problem is that there are no facilities, there are no commodities, there are no healthcare providers to provide reproductive health information and services. And so the only thing they concentrate on is um, gender-based violence and uh, female genital mutilation. So issues of being and uh, accessing family planning is not, um, as, I mean, it's not in their vocabularies. And still annually about 73 million uh, people or women have induced abortions. This is really um, happening in, in developing countries, including the Sub-Saharan Africa, which results to close to 220 deaths in 100,000 unsafe abortions um, every year. Next slide. 
So when you look at those numbers, it's not just about numbers. Uh, I mean, the death of even one woman in a community really is devastating because to the family, to the children that they leave behind, to the husband and their spouses, to their families, you know, it's just sad to lose even a single mother. I delivered women as a midwife for a very long time. And every time I had a mortality in the maternity ward, it traumatized me really, really seriously. Seeing women or families coming around and crying because a woman died from a pregnancy-related complication that would have been prevented was really devastating for me the years I practiced as a nurse midwife. And so every time I look at those numbers, I don't just look at them as numbers, but I look at them at the, uh, from the perspective of the number of families that are impacted the number of children that are left behind as, 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 as orphans, the number of spouses that are left behind as uh, widowers. And so it is sad. And, and, and even the, how much they will have contributed to the development of, of countries, uh, to the, the contribution, I mean, the contribution they will have made to their communities. So it is not just about the numbers, but numbers tell us a lot. And if you look at this map, really, this is a representation of um, the different countries according to the World Bank 2018 in how their GDPs look like. So uh, basically you look at this and you see the countries that are really, or that bear the branch of some of these in, in, uh, inequalities and inadequacies. Next slide. <laughs> so when you look at the, as we look at the facts, uh, we are seeing uh, that uh, international family planning Investing in international family planning really saves lives of women and children globally. But unfortunately, um, we still see that uh, there are policies that are regulating access to healthcare services for women and girls, especially because these are the people who are dying from complications, pregnancy related complications. And it's sad that uh, one of these policies is the global gag rule, a policy that we have fought for years in the the, the, the time of Ronald Reagan, and it, it is just saddening that as the years pass by, it gets worse. As other presidents come in power in the US, they are expanding the policy and even expanding the, the, the policy to other healthcare services or reproductive health services, like the Trump's global gag rule. That was really devastating, and I hope that it can never go beyond that at any given time. And the reason that I'm devastated that we will not have the Global Heart Act in the omnibus appropriation by the Congress. It really saddens me um, seeing this and relating to the numbers that we have seen, um, especially for the deaths resulting from pregnancy related complications that will have been prevented. Next slide. <laughs> Yeah, so um, as we, we saw from the, 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 the map, Africa is definitely um, struggling with SRH issues and challenges. And so we see high maternal, maternal mortalities, um, high teenage pregnancies and safe abortions, harmful practices like the female genital mutilation, child marriages, sexual and gender-based violence in most of the households in Africa. Uh, and those are the things that we are grappling with. And, and unfortunately, now we have uh, we have had two years of the the COVID pandemic, and we are also now seeing more of um, the effects of the climate crisis as um, also impacting negatively on these families in Africa that in global, I'll say, that are struggling even to access um, or to get some of these uh, services at their disposal. So really, uh, the situation doesn't really look good. Uh, given those other uh, emerging issues. <laughs> Next slide. Grace. <laughs> so yeah, um, this I just wanted to relate to what the global gag rule um, does in terms of how it impacts on other policies in other countries or other regions of the world. And so when you look at uh, the East African uh, as, uh, as a whole, we've had problem. I mean, I mean we ha we've had for many years or decades, uh, we've lived without a, a sexual and reproductive health bill. And so recently in 2017, one was introduced because uh, the global guard rule was actually um, a blow to many countries. And so 
it came as um, a huge thing, given that it was expanding to other services. And so the East African community wanted to come up with a legislation or a bill that will help uh, regulate services, um, access to services and, 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 and information in East Africa. And so this was also not received well by other countries, like for instance, um, when they were to have the second sitting in 20, 20, last year, actually, we had um, some countries um, like not attending. There was no representation from South Sudan. There was no representation from Burundi. And so the legislature, I mean, the, the assembly will not just pass the bill or rather proceed with the bill because the, they lack those kind of present, representations. And, and I, I'll say this is still um, as a, a, a result or as an effect of the global gag rule because their countries or their individuals who are still looking at what does the US say, what, what are the policies in, in the US say. And so you look, you see how much um, influence the American policy has on other policies, even as they trickle down to the individual countries. And as you go down, you look at, you will see what is happening currently in Kenya. If you just wanna go to the next slide, Grace. Yeah, so in Kenya, it's, I mean, East Africa is, Kenya is in East Africa. And so what is happening in East Africa is what is happening in Kenya. We have, uh, despite the fact that Kenya had its population policy way back in 1967, Kenya has still an unmet need of about 18% and a high mortality, maternal mortality rate of 30, 362 deaths per 100,000 live births. Uh, just recently, uh, this, this, this is in 2019, Kenya has still records about 500 um, women being admitted for unsafe abortion complications um, annually. And in a, a study carried out in 2012, women, uh, Kenya still loses about seven women every day. And this is sad because as we speak, um, just we are expecting that the Ministry of Health is um, launching or publishing our sexual and reproductive health policy 2022 to 2032. Like, unfortunately, this particular policy that is about to be launched, uh, most expected uh, next week on 23rd, has no, um, it has deleted all the, the messaging around abortion. It has no abortion access and information um, for the public, for women and girls. And so the civil society groups are really working on organizing how they can uh, petition that the Ministry of Health withholds that particular policy because it did not consult us as uh, civil society organizations or participants, or even the public. It was never shared with the public. And you look at these numbers and you just feel um, sick because really, Kenyans need to know why we still have this kind of debts, um, this number of debts in, in a world where we have technology, we have access, we have broad infrastructure that will allow women to access health facilities. I mean, we knew previously that we struggled with the three Ds, delays at the family level, delays at the facility, and delays at decision-making um, level by the healthcare providers. But this, I think that today can be um, done without, I mean, we should not be talking of delays given that we have improved infrastructure. We have improved, we have technology. A woman will just call the husband if they were to wait for a husband to come and make decision whether they should go to the hospital for labor and delivery. Today they can call if the husband was out fishing and come back and get them, uh, I mean, like, or even just send someone to a border border or a car to take them to the hospital. When they get to the hospital, we expect that there will be facilities even to, to take care of the woman in the ICU to resuscitate them and just save their life, you know? And um, so that is the situation on the ground. And, and I, as I said earlier, I started by mentioning the global guard rule, which has a huge influence on what happens on the ground. And, and especially in terms of what we get in our policies um, at the country level. Next slide. <laughs> Grace. Yeah, um, this was just to highlight really what the, the, the law in Kenya says about abortion. And so the constitution, uh, Article 26 of our constitution, um, 2010 constitution, 
gives us a leeway really to provide uh, abortion care, safe abortion care, I'll say, because um, it states that abortion is not permitted, um, except in the opinion of a trained healthcare provider, or if the life and or health of the mother is in danger, or if you can by any other given law. And so when you look at that statement, really, um, and how we define the w, uh, how we define health by the WHO is that uh, women who are depressed, women who are struggling with how um, with uh, stress because of a pregnancy that was unplanned, can should get access actually to safe abortion, as women who are not well. And so the, we are uh, categorize those women as uh, as women who are not healthy. Um, I think uh, looking globally, if you go to South Africa, I think the law in South Africa on abortion is also, uh, it, it also gives uh, some leeway on how providers should be able to provide abortion because they should be able to give um, clients all choices, including abortion care, so that um, they can decide whether they need to get it or not. Uh, unfortunately, in other countries like Tanzania, abortion is still not permitted. And the sad part of it is that uh, when girls get pregnant in Tanzania from my previous interviews is that they are not allowed to go back to return back to school. And that is saddening because it does not give the woman or the child, the girl child, the opportunity uh, to get empowered, get an education, get a job, get to, to, to grow, rather to contribute to the nation's development, you know? And, and that's sad, really. Um, yeah, next slide. Yeah, so um, I wanted just to highlight some of the, the, the effects of the global gag rule in addition to what I have already mentioned uh, from what I have gathered uh, previously. So generally is that the, 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 the policy really rolled back decades progress for women, young people and other vulnerable communities. And we have in, uh, witnessed assaults on women rights, family planning access, LGBTQ uh, plus rights, sexuality education, like uh, because of the policy in Kenya, we had, I mean, we had a policy that provided that, um, or rather that would have allowed comprehensive age appropriate sexuality education in schools. Unfortunately, this uh, document was never implemented simply because it was um, almost ready when the global gag rule was being uh, put in place or signed into, play, into, into policy by, by Donald Trump. And so that particular um, policy really uh, influenced negatively on how our comprehensive sexuality education in our schools would have been implemented. Um, so really, really sad. Next slide. Um, yeah, so those are the general view or effects of the global gag rule. But additionally, we had the, of course, funding laws for organizations. We had organizations just going through the chilling effect and individuals as well. We had disruption of um, SRH um, services, networking, referrals and partnerships. And we also saw governments were not being um, ready or willing to provide the, um, I mean, we lacked, the, the, the civil society organization actually lacked the political will that would help support them in their advocacy and, and, and uh, demand for um, their SRH scope of work and scope of information in different countries. Next slide. Yeah, so moving forward, um, I hope that we can re-strategize. I mean, we know that we have tried really much uh, for the people like Rebecca, the people who have worked on the Fight for Her campaign and the various advocate, different uh, movements that were built since 2017. We have done a lot to try to see to it that we have a permanent repeal to the global government. But this seemed not to be the case as of today. So, I mean, it, it just calls for a different strategy that we may re-strategize and think uh, again, what we need to do to, um, to, to, to get justice for SRH and just see women and girls enjoying their lives and living autonomous lives that will, will help them just grow and contribute and get empowered and contribute to their uh, own, own and even national development. So um, I think that we should provide, a, especially for policies that provide a leeway like 
the Kenyan law on abortion, the, the South African law, the US law, we should leverage on that, those laws and ensure that women do not struggle or do not die from unsafe abortion complication. And women do not struggle to get uh, those kind of services and information so that we can uh, provide those services. I mean, ask the providers and uh, increase service provision for women. And then we should work towards increasing funding. And, and this, I'm not a donor, of course. You may not be a donor, but you may contribute something towards that. If you know someone, uh, some donor or some funder who can get something for an organization, then I think that would be um, important that you give that kind of information. I want to appreciate Population Connection for the work we've done uh, in the past three years, I'll say. Um, just having the opportunity of having um, the, the leeway or rather the, the, the support from Population Connection for small organizations in Kenya has been really impactful. Uh, in the coastal region where we had some of the organizations that really were, were providing the, the, the services and information like Family Health Options Kenya. I had closed shop in the coastal region. Um, we actually got the small organization, such as youth organization being funded by Population Connection to help uh, increase or strengthen advocacy for um, SRH access for young people and, uh, and, and other different organizations that a Population Connection has supported. That was really important. And that is what I'm calling for. But if we can get more funding for small grassroots organizations that are, are passionate and really out to, to work towards increasing awareness, increasing uh, awareness for, in, I mean, on information, awareness on referral points and service provision uh, points so that uh, young people and women can get the services that they need. Uh, that will be helpful. I also feel that we need to pressure governments as they, they come up with those policies, like what I'm talking about that is about to come up from the Ministry of Education in Kenya. If we have the civil society organization um, like writing and documenting on the, some of the effects of what is happening and just pressurizing them that they need to include access to, to abortion services as one of the essential services. And actually the WHO really uh, categorizes safe abortion service as an essential service, just like um, malaria treatment, you know, like treatment for um, diarrhea. Um, so uh, we need to pressurize government so that we can follow the WHO recommendations. Um, increased advocacy, of course, for a permanent repeal to the global guard rule and increased um, mobilization and just um, working with more uh, multilateral uh, sectors just to get more strength uh, to for advocacy. I think that will be helpful. <clears throat> I should be finishing, Grace. Thank you so much, Melvin. We'll have, I have a lot of questions for you, I know, and I'm sure our audience will as well. Um, but first, yeah. I'm gonna go ahead and uh, turn it over to Jalicia for her remarks. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon or morning or good night, depending on which side of our world you are based on. Can you hear me? Wonderful. Okay. That was a wonderful uh, presentation um, by my colleague, Melvin. I just want to thank you sort of for providing that really um, comprehensive overview of just kind of the, the landscape of reproductive health and politics and rights um, and inequality, right, and access in um, in a global context, particularly in, in Africa. And you pointed out something that I, is going to be the core of my presentation today. And it's, you mentioned kind of like what is needed, what are the conditions that are needed to help people live autonomous lives, right? And I think that's really important. Autonomous lives in terms of access to reproductive autonomy, to bodily integrity, right? And, um, and you also mentioned just kind of the importance of like, and crucial things like increasing access to funding, increasing advocacy and really support on the ground. And, you know, the grassroots mobilization, the grassroots work, that local and global advocacy has been crucial in the context of the Caribbean, also in the US, um, although heavily I'll focus on the Caribbean in this context. And I'm happy to talk further about um, the US in the Q&A conversation. But first, let me introduce myself a little bit more. I'm a reproductive justice educator and practitioner. Um, I'm working in a global context, making connections between how we might combat inequality, um, illness, and reproductive violence from the U.S. to the Caribbean to 
um, where most of my work is located, and more recently to um, Sub-Saharan Africa. And I am really invested in connecting my research and organizing to community interventions that are culturally informed and appropriate, gender specific and invested in a reproductive justice lens um, in ways that really <coughs> help us provide, uh, meet the sort of everyday needs of, um, of people on, on the ground. And part of my work that I do um, in the US also is kind of working as a, one of the co-organizers and leaders of the Massachusetts COVID-19 Maternal Equity Coalition, where I'm really being intentional, um, working with colleagues to build the divides across pra medical practitioners, researchers, activist organizers, birth justice workers, um, um, help policy experts and legislators to really think about how we can collectively bridge our experiences and our expertise and our different social locations and institutional positions to really develop and implement evidence-based interventions to improve black and brown birth outcomes and really to expand healthcare access while combating structural racism and its multiple manifestations in terms of care, in terms of reproductive health system, um, and in terms of kind of um, who gets prioritized in, in services and in funding and even in interventions. So that's the kind of another piece of the work that I'm, that I'm doing um, in the US context. And I wanna also point out that the lens that I take my, um, that I take to my work is our RJ lens, reproductive justice. And what that means for me is really, um, what it's defined as not just only a woman's right to have a child, but also the right to have children and raise them with dignity and safe, healthy and supportive environments. And that this, this, um, definition um, comes from um, Loretta Ross and Dorothy Roberts who are leading reproductive justice um, at, uh, educators and practitioners. And this is really paying attention to the ways race racism, gender, class, um, and structures come together to literally determine who accesses care and who accesses the resources necessary to live, survive, and thrive, right? And so this is really important for me because what I'm talking about today is what local people have been doing, what their experiences are on the ground, and exactly what this means for our global work around RJ advocacy, okay? And for me, what's really important about RJ as a lens is that it's focused on how do you allow, what are the enabling conditions, right? That are required for people to have control of their bodies and destinies, for, for people to be able to exercise their right, right? Um, their, um, um, to have control of their bodies, but also to think about um, what, what they're able to access and how they're enabled to sort of exert their agency in different contexts. So I wanna start with a photo. Um, you can share the first image, please, thank you. And this photo is important because it really kind of laid the groundwork for how I came into this work um, at a different stage, interweaving my HIV organizing work with my um, newly trained doula knowledge and my reproductive justice um, advocacy. I'm sorry, it's the other image. Yes, thank you. And this image um, is really important to me because when I think about how are we going to end these structures of violence that make it hard for people to survive, thrive, birth, parent, um, raise family, sustain their community? I, sorry, I think about this often from um, a community perspective, right? The, the perspective of communities, the perspective of local organizing on the ground. And so when I look at um, this image, well, first off this image, um, came, I came across, I was a part of um, this, uh, this sort of community building, community organizing work that, um, that the folks in this image are involved with. And it was a part of the time where I was sort of observing the ways um, Jamaican women were grappling with um, reproductive inaccess, with illness that is like HIV AIDS that is quite stigmatizing with inequality while doing this, while being pillars of their communities and while being politi politically engaged, right? And so what was important about this is that, so this was an initiative, by the way, that, um, that really uh, bridged together 
newly diagnosed um, women with women who've been living with HIV for a while. And, he, and they're pictured here in a community health workshop in an antenatal clinic in Kingston. And it's a part of this work is a sort of huge component of, um, it's called the Mentor Mom Initiative. And it's a part of the work of an organization called E for Life. E for Life is Jamaica's first and only woman led HIV AIDS care and advocacy organization. And it's based in different parts of Jamaica. So, um, and it's primary headquarters is in Kingston, the capital. And it's the country's first psychosocial and advocacy organization that's specifically bridging HIV AIDS care with reproductive health um, rights, um, um, rights, care, and sort of health and justice. And it's also meant for women who are HIV, who are HIV positive and their children, as well as those who are um, survivors of sexual violence. And so in what's fascinating about this group that the women here are pictured in is that they provide accessible medical knowledge to each other. They help each other process their diagnosis. They teach each other about how the disease works in their bodies, how the medication works in their bodies. They exchange experiences that are related to sex, sexuality, reproduction, and parenting. Um, they even exp exchange experiences about how to navigate sort of in access to care, how to navigate violence, um, uh, um, and, and how to navigate disclosure. So multiple issues across the sort of healthcare spectrum. And, um, and I, as I mentioned, the sort of mentor moms are sort of the educators of HIV and sexual reproductive health, and the mentee moms are the newly diagnosed women and students in training. And this model was actually adopted. It's an Afro-diasporic model, right? So it's from a global template that was adopted from Uganda, and their really successful HIV care work that happened in the 80s, 90s. And in general, the E for Life organization in Jamaica provides a continuum of psychosocial care and support services that include gender specific and reproductive health services. Um, and, you know, this includes uh, a sort of a lot of things. So it can involve helping, you know, with daily tasks, right? Helping women gauge the emotional and psychic and physical impacts of, the, of their diagnosis, sending them reminders to take ARV medication, attend to medical appointments, accompanying women to clinic visits, connecting them to sort of relevant social and health services, documenting, helping document their sort of risk factors that might heighten the progression of HIV to AIDS, right? And so there are multiple things that really helps focus in on this work. And what's important for it about this sort of approach to the, the organizations that I'm engaged with, um, such as Sister Song in the United, sorry, Sister Love in the United States, it's based in Atlanta and has a, another um, post in South Africa. And they've been around for it about um, 30 years. I think they recently um, celebrated their 30th anniversary. And that's led by uh, Dazon Diallo Dixon. Um, and organizations like E for Life in Jamaica, it's, it's really encouraging people to bridge together reproductive health and HIV AIDS in a way that has not always been considered or foregrounded in the delivery of care. And importantly, it's moving beyond HIV as exclusively a biomedical diagnosis, right? We all, well, hopefully we all know by now in this fourth decade of the pandemic, as we're living through another one, COVID, that you cannot just look at pandemics and diseases as only scientific like realities, right? Like they're not just about biology, right? They have very unique um, transmission experiences, trajectories, lived experiences, social realities that are heavily shaped by what people have access to, where people live, who they are, you know, and where their where their lives and, and are which kind of what conditions and structures their lives are based within, and sadly, but that's the reality, right? So organizations like E for Life and Sister Love are moving beyond. They're part of this movement to move beyond the sort of biomedical focus on HIV and think about the ways to intentionally empower communities to mobilize resources and advocate for women's economic, political, civil rights as well as their reproductive health. Um, needs and, and, and rights, right? And so this grassroots work looks different because it's not only focused on sort of, it not only offers direct services such as like trauma counseling, orphan care, care packages of canned food, baby formula, hygienic products, right? So thinking about the holistic, <clears throat> but it's also functioning to build the capacities of local communities to address their issues, intersecting issues, not just only related to HIV AIDS, although it, um, extremely connected to it, but addressing issues such as poverty, such as um, stigma, violence, right? Gender-based violence, community violence, 
sexual health, um, reproductive, you know, justice, gender inequality, right? And and part of why this is also um, important is it's also connecting women to economic empowerment and leadership training workshops, which is what Efa Life focuses on, right? So their so their social service provisioning is a pragmatic and strategic response to the host of intersecting needs that people have, right? And it's really pushing governments and states and global organizations that are the predominant funders to really expand the politic their political and funding agendas, right? Because you can't just focus on disease, like sort of getting drugs into diseases, but you have to consider the holistic approach that melds together reproductive health services and care with sort of HIV AIDS, um, uh, the unique needs of HIV AIDS, people living with HIV AIDS and their care concerns, right? Um, and, and this includes efforts to address employment, food insecurity, intimate partner violence, education, right? Medication adherence, right? Um, really moving beyond the focus on just disease progression and behavior change. So I'll take a step back to say, um, this is an important image as you can imagine. And this is important work because it's really allowing us to sort of um, see the ways local communities from the United States to Jamaica to beyond, right, really speaking back to the sort of pathologizing and restrictive and coercive narratives that link women living with HIV, particularly Black women in, in the global context living with HIV, that link them sort of inevitably with in, infection and mortality in ways that don't consider their holistic lives and needs, in ways that don't consider the ways they're doing the work to organize on their behalf in the absence of state structures and government resources to support them, um, particularly in countries that are heavily dependent on IMF, um, sort of loans and indebted to the IMF, right? The, the public health infrastructure is incredibly inc um, completely gutted and I'm happy to talk more about that in depth. So I wanna take another step back to say kind of on a national scale, what's happening in Jamaica right now regarding um, HIV and sexual reproductive health, there's been a massive mobilization to, um, to, to bring together the sort of uh, HIV and reproductive health needs. And so there's a, there's a plan called the National Integrated Strategic Plan for Sexual and Reproductive Health. And it, um, the recent plan is from 2014 and 2019. So they're actually in deliberation and conversations and consultations right now to develop a new plan that I think is, um, it will be coming out soon, but it's heavily informed by sort of the experience of reproductive health and injustice while going through two pandemics, HIV AIDS and COVID. So I'm interested in seeing what that plan looks like. But this important plan, the one that was recently um, was, was produced, is that it's really giving detailed benefits of the integration of the need for the integration of um, sexual reproductive health and the HIV response, right? Beyond just the sort of improved quality of care and sort of enhanced, you know, uh, uh, sort of program effectiveness, but really that it allows, you know, it mutually reinforcing and complementary sort of legal and policy frameworks, right? As opposed to having sort of policy frameworks that either provide access to reproductive health, but might create stigmatizing sort of experiences for HIV, people living with HIV. Um, you know, one of those such policies is that um, is a breastfeeding policy, which in the intent is good, but one of the, one of the requirement is that it doesn't allow um, specific women, it doesn't allow women to sort of enter into the sort of public health facilities um, with uh, sort of feeding, with, with feeding bottles, right? Um, and the idea behind that is that it's supposed to support, you know, breast milk as the best source of nutrition. But one of the, one of the issues is that is that there are competing messages that many women living with HIV receive that says, um, you're not supposed to breastfeed your child. So what is what happens when you're in a sort of situation where you're encountering a security guard who sees the sort of bottle or feeding in your bag and is asking you to discard it or requiring you to not enter the facilities with it, it puts you in a situation that can often sort of risk exposure of an HIV status, right? Or that sort of requires more labor to sort of explain what, what this means for you, right? And while you're trying to access care. So trying to find ways for sexual reproductive health policies and HIV response to not conflict with each other in not helpful ways, right? And the, 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 this integrated strategic plan is also trying to find ways for people living with HIV to access these services that are tailored to their needs, right? And that also improves the coverage of underserved, vulnerable women and, and all underserved and vulnerable populations, I should say broadly, right? So this includes um, 
LGBTQIA folks, this includes, um, in addition to queer populations, it includes sort of youth, right? Youth and, and to have sort of issues accessing these services broadly. And it certainly includes um, women who, all of these groups who are facing these sort of overlapping, um, overlapping structural, social and structural vulnerabilities that make accessing service really hard. Um, and just what I'll briefly note in a, in a Jamaican context, there are 18 um, public and six private hospitals providing maternity care. And the Ministry of Health, you know, while the, which is a governing body, while it direct maternal, health, while direct maternal health deaths have declined significantly, the Ministry of Health notes that there has been indirect deaths due to HIV, due to cardiovascular disease, um, sickle cell disease, and neoplasms. Right, those have increased, and so right now the leading de direct causes of maternal death are hypertension, hemorrhage. Um, and obstetric embolism. And, and many of these, uh, mo you know, most of the maternal deaths occur between women ages 20 and 34 of age, right? A having a second or third baby. And so I just want to also zoom out to say kind of these are rates that are, you know, exponential for Jamaican context, and, but, but also overlap with this trend in the Caribbean where there's an unmet need for sexual reproductive health care, right? And these include services that together ensure people can decide whether and when to have a child. Also services that allow people to experience safe in pregnancy and delivery and postpartum care and have healthy um, babies as well as a safe and um, satisfying uh, sexual reproductive health life. Um, and so much of this is because of the way in which, you know, class, gender, sexual racism operate in powerful ways to deny people access to care. But also a lot of this is like structural context where a lot of countries such as H, um, Jamaica and Haiti, right, who have really um, disproportionate rates of HIV relative to the other, um, uh, the, the other countries in the Caribbean, um, structural adjustment programs have heavily imposed and reduced investments in the care for um, uh, populations, right? And, and much of that has shifted the, the, the labor of taking care of communities on, um, on to, to take, of taking care of people and vulnerable populations on everyday communities, right? So when the cycle, when the social and psychological welfare of citizens is placed on communities that are already struggling to access care, right? As the countries are trying to work on servicing their debt, one can imagine what kind of stressors as well as sort of um, just, uh, uh, stressors and also just challenges that are caused like, like that, right? Because countries like Jamaica and Haiti as well as others see, are seeing cuts in funding and healthcare, right? Which are, which are accompanying these other sort of um, uh, uh, challenges, right? Not to mention the pandemic. And so when I think about the dependency on external aid, and I think about the, the immense need for reproductive health services, not to mention the importance of integrating HIV AIDS care with reproductive services and really engaging um, women and girls in really intentional ways that consider and not compartmentalize their needs, right? Their reproductive health and HIV needs from other, you know, really thinking about it in a holistic way and not as, um, as mutually uh, conflicting. I, I, I think often about kind of just, um, just kind of the the sort of uh, the the need for better structures of support, the need to sort of fund communities, the need for better political advocacy, so people can understand how these issues are intersecting, um, and how the structures are denying um, that kind of holistic uh, investment, um, and that that's certainly needed at the local level. And you can turn to the next pitch, the next image, please. I um, want to turn to this image because um, this is a silent protest shortly before the pandemic um, against sexual violence in the context of HIV AIDS. And I wanted to turn to this image because I think it's, when I think about the immense inequality that we're faced with, I also think about the sort of immense organizing that's on the ground and how people have been, um, uh, you know, really, uh, sort of really trying to do this work. And I'm going to wrap up and just say, because I'd love to talk about this in Q&A, um, much of this work is done by communities on the ground. They're prioritizing sort of integrating, you know, service delivery with advocacy. They're prioritizing sort of recognizing the lived experiences of people and not just focusing 
on them as pathologized populations, not doing that and not just focusing on them as sort of a deficit, using a deficit approach, but looking at them as assets in their own communities and in the ways in which they have immense agency and capacity to sort of build the futures they would like to build for themselves and meeting people where they are um, and not assuming that we can take a one size fits all um, to address all of these issues. And so much of this depends on making sure we're foregrounding um, the, the kind of work that's already being done in the absence of government services, um, investments in care um, to combat multiple inequalities as well as um, a, a sort of um, often hostile policy landscape that involves rules such as the global gag rules, among others. And I'll stop and I'm looking forward to diving in further in the Q&A. Thank you so much, Delicia. And thank you again, Malveen. Um, I think we're going to drop a note in the chat, but we're, we have so much great stuff to talk about. I think we're going to go a little bit over two. Um, PM. So would love for you all to stay if you're able. Um, if you're not able to stay past two, that's okay. You can just drop off and, and thank you for joining. Um, but the first question I had for you both uh, is what are the greatest struggles uh, the organizations you work with, you're working with, are currently facing? I know we've talked about the pandemic and really challenging political landscapes and all sorts of structural things that really impede people's access to reproductive health care and HIV care. So I'm just curious to hear um, some examples of, of specific struggles or barriers that organizations you're working with are facing. Um, Jalicia, if you want to go first. Sure, yeah. I'll just briefly say that one of the struggles that um, they're facing, I think, is really access to funding. Um, and it's really also communicating to funders what are their needs that are specific to their region and to their population as opposed to kind of fitting a kind of one size fits all that we know does not work when you're thinking about reproductive health services. So I think in addition to funding, there's, you know, there's because of the reduced um, streams of um, funding pools, um, there's, there's just been Re reduced funding pools for particularly for, for, for girls and women globally are I think definitely in this region, it becomes harder to sort of make the case when, you know, there's a lot of um, competition for funding for populations that are deemed more prioritized. And so I think um, under one of, in the conversation that I had with one of the organizational leaders, one of the things that was mentioned is why do we have to wait for a population to be suffering at disproportionate rates, which already is happening for us to sort of deem it as worthy of being funded or as sort of a prioritized um, um, uh, group for intervention, right? And how do you sort of center the people who know their needs, who are interacting with this on the ground in a way that um, really combats the one size fits all universal approach to, to um, reproductive services and, and HIV care. Um, so I think that's one thing, it's certainly funding. Um, and also with, within the pandemic, it was certainly not being able to meet with people in person is hard for this kind of work where you are dealing with such you know, highly sensitive and vulnerable challenges that require that in-person connection that required, right? The, what I, the image that I showed you opening up with was a social support group that relied on the intimate connection of people in person to help people deal with the combat, the effects of isolation and stigma. And of course, you know, COVID kind of really undermined um, the sort of force of that work, um, uh, especially when you think of like going on Zoom, not everyone has access to internet, not everyone has, has access to consistent, reliable data network that would allow them to be able to participate in a, in, a, in a sort of psychosocial support group. And perhaps they live in spaces where there are multiple people who are witnessing the conversation. Talking about HIV in that context, it becomes really hard. Even talking about any need for reproductive service that allows you to exercise autonomy control becomes really challenging if you have a partner, intimate partner at home, if you have you know, relatives at home, or even if you're in a, on the veranda and your community members are there. So it's, 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 um, those are some of the challenges I first, that, that are existing right now. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for that. Um, Melvin, turn it over to you. Thank you, Rebecca, for that question. And thank you, Delisha, for, uh, uh, for those illustrations. So I just want to add that uh, in addition to funding, um, Delisha mentioned that uh, like in Kenya, someone just asked me like, why would Americans wait until we get HIV and then try to bring us funding to treat our HIV? And the same question someone asked, why would we wait until women are dying or women die from uh, unsafe abortions and think then we want to find family planning? Why don't we do it now? So funding is a big one. And in addition, um, 
we I know that from the the effects of the global gap rule, women are still stigmatized. Organization are still stigmatized. My recent uh, interview with an organization was that they even have trouble referring girl, young girls for safe abortion services because the girls are still stigmatized. Organizations still not talk. And in fact, the question they, someone asked, a project officer asked me was, has the global gag rule been even repealed? We have not felt the impact yet. You know, like they haven't still felt the, the repeal. And so it's still um, difficult for them to make referrals and even still speak um, openly about uh, abortion, safe abortion services. Yet, as I mentioned earlier, this is, I mean, a safe abortion service is part of the essential services under the WHO um, guidelines or recommendations. And the other thing I wanted to say is, of course, the opposition. It's still huge, hugely felt on the ground. Like um, the other day I went to Kibera. I mean, during our community entry as a new organization in, in, in a community, I was told like, I went to this organization and, and I was seeking partnership as an organization that does almost what we do. And one of their policies is that they do not uh, interact with pro organizations that are talking about abortion. And as a, an abortion activist, I mean, I cannot separate abortion from my SRH docket. So, you know, so I told them that's fine. Um, we are happy to, to work together, collaborate in other areas and not just the SRH component. Yeah, so the organization that's still going through that. And uh, of course, those organizations that were gagged against um, the US funding previously are still not interacting with organizations that were, did not sign to the policy. So um, those are really key issues um, that we are facing as an organization. Thank you. Thank you. Back to you, Rebecca. Thank you. Yeah, it's a lot of different different factors colliding and working against people. So sort of keeping that in mind, I'm curious, um, two part question. Um, one, uh, first part, how are the communities you're working with currently organizing for their reproductive health and rights? And then since you both touched on and talked about stigma and sort of the role of stigma, what are these communities and organizations doing to destigmatize reproductive health care, reproductive rights, HIV care? Um, and how are they sort of working, working on both of those things? Yeah, absolutely. That's a great question, I think. Um, so our organization is taking multiple approaches. I think one of the things that e for Life is doing is really focusing on how you develop the capacity of um, the, the sort of the capacities of everyday people to advocate for themselves. Um, although it should not only depend on everyday people, because we should not abdicate the government, our governments, from you know sort of their responsibility to making sure that we have structures of care and support needed to sustain our communities and to survive. But um, developing the capacities of everyday people, they focus on kind of really emphasizing the psychosocial piece, right? So like not just only emphasizing that, get access to medicine, right? So it's like service integration with advocacy and no, really knowing and prioritizing what the core issues are and how you know, you kind of have to meet people where they are in order to get there instead of coming in and posing an idea of health and well-being that is dis that is sort of disconnected from their material conditions and their, you know, everyday sort of realities and experiences, right? Um, and so I think in addition to sort of get, having, literally providing people access to basic resources, because we all know if you're, you know, you don't have food, if you don't have shelter, it's going to make adhering to medication, antiretroviral medication is really hard. So access to basic resources in addition to sort of youth, culturally informed and youth um, friendly, um, uh, gender specific uh, social services um, and establishing this political voice, right? So that involves really inviting people to those meetings with high level officials, with donors, right? With really um, facilitating those interactions so that they can put a face to statistics instead of just kind of leading with um, the, the sort of data, right? So how do you sort of literally situate and meet people in their life and in their experiences? Um, and I would say, in, in terms of your first part, your, your second part of the question. Um, oh, sorry. The first, I want to mention something for the first part. Literally strategizing in global networks is so crucial. Um, when I talk to the, the organizational leaders, the co-founders, but also certainly the participants, one of the things they've, they've really benefited from is literally meeting with other HIV activists, reproductive justice <laughs> activists, organizers in other spaces, regions, in the, within the Caribbean, within Jamaica and beyond it, right? I know there's a conference, I believe in Mali um, that one 
um, one of the my interlocutors and my part the participants talked about as being so crucial to her development and consciousness raising as an as an organizer. So I think taking all of that together, when people unite in conference spaces, you know, in and beyond hotel rooms and lobbies, in the streets and beyond, right at a protest like the one I shared and beyond, it really allows people to exchange strategies, to exchange experiences in a way that doesn't always have to allow them to reinvent the wheel. And so much I want to do want to mention so much of part of that resource and experience and strategy sharing is also using those you, you sort of for example like international universal declaration of human rights using those international kind of frameworks and commitments that the jamaican government and a few many other governments have committed to in on paper and verbally using that to really hold those sort of um uh governments accountable and so it is one way that my the, the, that sort of the participants in my work as well as the people in the organization gain legibility and are able to access, you know, have their rights be elevated on a global context is when they say, well, you've committed to this, um, to this, uh, to this platform. It gives them a platform to elevate their concerns. You've committed to this body of, you know, rights. This is where, you know, it's lacking. You know, what does this commitment mean if we are, you know, suffering every day and, and literally experiencing challenges to sort of meet the basic needs that were already outlined in this commitment. So I think that it serves as a, even if it's not as powerful and strong, it sounds, it serves as some one, one sort of level of accountability mechanism and structure that allows them to be legible um, to, to authority figures that might sort of easily disregard their concerns otherwise. Um, and the last thing I'll say is about the stigma. One thing they do to destigmatize is literally have health fairs in local communities where they're offering services beyond just HIV testing. They, where they're talking about multiple things beyond HIV testing, where they're bringing in contraceptives, um, you know, so heavily a lot of condoms, also female condoms, where they're bringing in sort of information that many people would otherwise not sort of access, right? So they go to the underserved populations, um, populations that will generally not go to a public health facility unless it's literally a life and death situation or a crisis and go to them in a space because oftentimes health is a luxury and being able to follow up with health is a luxury when survival and, and sort of everyday needs is a concern. So having those health um, conferences, those health fairs and connecting to people on the ground about HIV it also, but also beyond it and really having people meet other people in person to engage with like what their holistic health needs are. That's one way they address that. Thank you. Thank you, Jalicia. It's really encouraging to hear all of all of the things people are doing and the steps they're taking to combat all of the sort of barriers thrown up thrown up in the way. Um, Melvin, did you want to add to that? Yes, thank you, Rebecca. And thank you, Jalicia. That was really a comprehensive and exactly really like it's what is happening across uh, the globe. And um, I just want to add something that you've not touched on or mentioned, and that is happening in Kenya. We have a network of reproductive healthcare providers by um, like a whole network of close to 600 providers come together. And so the reproductive health network, which is the main um, like advocacy organization in Kenya in terms of advocating for SRH and justice, has been able to do a lot of training for their service provider, value clarification, just enabling them to have the skill and the information that they need to share with the communities that they serve. So this is like a network that is across the country, like in every corner of the country. And they have been working really hard to ensure that healthcare providers have the booklets. Currently, today actually, they just launched a training booklet, pocket booklet for healthcare providers that is a gender transformative, uh, that has a gender transformative approach to safe abortion. So enabling healthcare providers to know exactly what to communicate with the communities or the individuals that they, they are providing the services to. And so that kind of like just enables us to cover the entire country, you know, despite the policies in place, despite us not having the policies, at least we have providers on the ground who can be able to provide that kind of information that the, the, the people need and even the services that they need. Um, so I recently visited one of the farthest county next to Tanzania, just to interview the pro a, a provider who is a member of the network. And she sees um, a wide range of uh, clients right from Tanzania who cross across just on border border riders to come really long distance, close to hundred miles to seek abortion services in Kenya, you know? 
So given that we have that network, I think we have been able to, it has been really important for our people, our women and girls from both had to reach and even the urban settings to receive or be able to know exactly what they need and what they require uh, in terms of family planning, in terms of SRA services and information. And we also know that, uh, of course, the civil society organization has formed a group that they have, I'll say, a sustainable coalition that is working really hard to ensure that we have the, the, the public aware of what is happening, what the opposition are doing, and what the government needs to do to support um, the, our work. So again, we keep sharing information, we keep writing, we keep uh, signing, um, like um, we have been signing uh, on a different um, things just to ensure that we, 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 uh, we have the correct information in the public domain, and then that we can be able to get the, the government uh, or political will uh, for uh, advocacy. Thank you. Thank you, Melvin. Again, it's just really great to hear about all of the actions people are taking and the organizing communities are doing to address these issues. Um, want to be mindful of time, but I do want to take a question from Karen in the audience. Um, she's curious if, uh, will the abortion pill work in countries like Kenya and Tanzania? And then a second part, will it work in remote areas um, where people don't necessarily know how to read, haven't yet learned how to read, um, and where that might be sort of an issue of access? Uh, maybe Melvin, you want to take that first? Yes. Yes, thank you. And I know that is Karen. Uh, I'll say the abortion pill is actually available in Kenya, except of course that is given under precautions and actually going by the WHO recommendation or guidelines on self-care. If you want to read about self-care by WHO, it just actually recommends that a service provider can provide abortion care via phone, like via telemedicine. Just get the client, get them, give you their correct history, give them the, what they need to do, like send them for an ultrasound just to be sure that um, the, 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 the fetus or rather the, 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 the pregnancy is in the right uh, position in the uterus, not in the tubes, of course, and then get to know the gestation and provide them um, with where they can access the abortion pill. Uh, so abortion pills are available in Kenya to say that. And this can still be available in Tanzania if you just get to know the organization that you can work with. Like I interviewed previously with, um, I forget getting the name, but this organ a member of an association organization with uh, in the Planned Parenthood, International Planned Parenthood in Tanzania. They are, of course, um, a reproductive health organization. And so uh, working with them closely, definitely we can get the abortion pill in Tanzania and just get clients. But I know it's a lot of work that needs to be done to get Tanzanians to understand that uh, uh, they can access abortion pills from the providers on the ground. Yeah, so uh, that is it. Um, I think the second question, part of that question was um, about, Rebecca, do you want to repeat? Mind me or repeat? Sure. I think there is a question of of how to how to get uh, access to the abortion pill in um, remote areas where there might be high rates of literacy and there might be other sort of challenges to to, to access. Yes, thank you. That might be a bit a, a little difficult, especially in in Tanzania, as compared to Kenya. As I say, I mentioned we have a network of a, a, a wide network of providers from every corner of Kenya. And so we've been working closely with the Reproductive Health Network who also are the providers of the abortion, I mean, the suppliers with the abortion pills. And that might be a bit, a little different from the Tanzanian situation. But of course, as I mentioned, there's a lot of work that may need to be done to get the providers on the ground to get uh, the pills to the clients specifically. In, in such remote areas where they cannot read. And I know in Tanzania, of course, they, the issue of language, because they use a different language than the pill, that the language that comes with the pill. So yeah, a lot of work may need to be done in Tanzania, but in Kenya, as we speak, abortion pills are available. And I'm just hoping that uh, with our next um, national survey, we see a reduction in the number of unsafe abortions and we see a, 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 an increase or an uptick of um, safe abortion services. Thank you, Karen. Thank you, Melvin. Jalicia, did you have anything you wanted to add to that? 
Yes, um, it's it'll be quick because it's currently not accessible in Jamaica. Jamaican law bans abortion with a penalty of life, life in jail. <laughs> and this um, currently activists on the ground are working with like really demanding decriminalization by sharing their abortion experiences and advocating to overturn um, the 1864 Act, right? Um, and so this has been brought to parliament on a vote and um, it was introduced by one of the lawmakers who happened to be an Olympian, a former Olympian. And so I think that in combination with the high profile, but also with the sort of local organizing and this sort of global context where there's the sort of resurgence of this question, but also like actual victories. Um, we're hoping that that collective pressure can really do much to undermine this human rights violation. Thank you. Yeah, it'll be always looking, always looking forward to see, to seeing what developments and, and progress is being made in all of these different locations and contexts. Um, I would love to keep this going because I know people have more questions, but I want to be mindful of folks' time. We're already quite a bit over. Um, so Melvin and Jalicia, if you each wanted to take just a minute each with any final thoughts you wanted to leave folks with, um, kind of focusing maybe on the way forward, how we can make things better, how we can work together to make things better, um, that would be great. Um, Melvin, do you want to start? Of course, um, thank you, uh, Rebecca. And I just want to appreciate everyone who took the time to contribute their voices, their questions, and even just listening to us and getting to understand what is happening globally. Um, I just want to say that uh, we still hear cases like Jamaica where there's still uh, difficulties accessing some of these services. We still have uh, issue, other emerging issues like the climate crisis that is impacting, even exacerbating the impact of um, the struggle that women are going through uh, in terms of lack of access to family planning, lack of access to comprehensive sexuality, uh, sexual and reproductive health services. And so uh, that just calls for us, like a call to action for us is how do we collaborate more? I mean, like, how do we form sustainable collaboration as partners and as individuals who are really passionate about what we are fighting for so that we can keep fighting and just get to, to see a moment or years or decades when we will have a free world with, where women and girls can, and any other person can access um, their reproductive justice and, and, and just live free lives. Thank you. Thank you, Malveen. Delicia? Yes, um, totally echoing the sentiment shared by my colleague Malveen absolutely invested in forming sustainable coalitions of resource sharing, of sort of rights building, of network making, and of really just kind of political strategy exchange so that we don't always have to reinvent the wheel, but also so that we can understand how we can take these important templates and apply them to our particular regions in very culturally informed and tailored ways. Um, I'm excited about the future. I'm excited about what's happening now. And it's um, spaces like this that I think are important sites for re-energizing um, and, and, and um, rebuilding and restoring ourselves in this movement work. Thank you. Thank you, Jalicia. Um, thank you both again for joining us, for your expertise and your wisdom and sharing your stories um, and your experiences. We're so grateful to you. And thanks to everyone in the audience for your comments and questions. And thanks for sticking with us and going, going a little bit over. We really appreciate it.